Welcome back, everybody. Since the last episode, I sat for a day with the computer in front of me on my bench, and I noticed that the traces on the keyboard PCB, and amazing, I didn't notice before, but look at those. There are some black splot splotches on them uh, that may be corrosion. Uh, I actually do think it is corrosion, but the only way to know for sure is to look at it under the microscope to see if there is a loss of material. And sure enough, look at, look, look at that. There is a loss of material. It is indeed corrosion. Now, uh, the keyboard is still working, so no traces have become open, but they will if I don't deal uh, with this. Look, this, this is a bad spot. There's a lot of loss of material there. So I have to retain the traces. I have to put a new coat of solder on top of them. But to do that, I need to prepare the surface so the new solder sticks to it. And I will do it with a fiberglass pen first that will allow me to apply some gentle abrasion on top of the traces to remove the grime and fats and, and dirt so the new solder can stick to it uh, with flux. So I, I just carefully used the fiberglass pen everywhere and once I was done I blew away the, the dust, the fiberglass dust um, uh, with my, my, my duster and I finished up uh, with IPA and a pad uh, to make sure that there were no chemicals left um, that could prevent solder, solder from uh, getting stuck to it. But before I went ahead, I looked at it under the microscope again, make sure that the surface was well treated and I didn't remove too much material with the fiberglass and everything is looking okay. Uh, there is clearly less uh, dirt now and the surface on top is shiny. So we are good to go to retin this. I will be using a professional SMD flux. I suggest that to you, FL22P. It's expensive. Uh, it's for SMD rework, uh, but it works very well. And I coat um, the traces I'm going to retin with a liberal layer uh, of flux. A very liberal layer, because the secret here is to use a lot of good quality flux. And I will be using a bevel tip as you can see there one millimeter bevel uh, 45 degrees angle and a flat surface so it allows you to transfer heat very well to the traces uh, but at the same time maintain control because it's only one millimeter wide so i basically retrace the traces uh, with a little bit of a new solder uh, on the tip reloading it as necessary this is another area where i did it so i filmed it with more detail this time I put a little bit of solder on the tip and then I just retrace <laughs> the traces carefully uh, immersed in, in flux. So the new tin uh, takes, takes hold uh, of the underlying metal um, and, 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 and reconstitutes the trace. Now cleaning it is, is a pain. It's a lot of IPA and uh, static safe uh, uh, wipes. Uh, it takes quite a while. Uh, I'm just doing a quick quick cleaning at this point to see how the work um, has been going and uh, I will be satisfied with the result and then retin the entire PCB. Look at this. Uh, there's a lot of material back but where the solder looks darker that, that was the pitting that was there before and the pitting is now covered and there's an extra layer of metal on top of it still. Uh, here's another section where uh, pitting was serious. Now there's a very thick layer uh, of solder on top. Um, so conductivity will be uh, in top notch now. Here is another area. There you go. Uh, here the pitting was so severe that there was no material for the new solder to grab hold of. But it's still, I put a thick layer weaving around uh, the pits. So you still have recovered uh, conductivity. I'm quite satisfied with this. So it's time to put the keyboard uh, back in the case. Um, and that will give us an opportunity to inspect with the naked eye the traces again to compare with the original footage. And look at that. Everything is shiny. If you see an oily surface, that's the Deoxid D5 that I put on top of everything to protect it. And this was the area in which the corrosion was the worst. And look at this. Everything's continuous, thick and shiny. Brand new metal in there. I'm very pleased with this, re this result. It took 47 years for the corrosion to take place, uh, to take hold in there. Uh, and this will take a lot more than 47 years for it to become as bad <laughs> as it was before. So this, this is good for a few decades um, now. Uh, 
Now, of course, we need to test the keyboard because you never know if you bridged two neighboring traces. I paid a lot of attention and was very careful, but I test every key again and they are all working. And now it's time for the finishing touches. Uh, you might remember that there was a missing uh, um, uh, heat sink that I wanted to put on that little transistor to the left. And I put a heat sink there that looks like an inverted hat. And that transistor now, instead of going to 55 degrees Celsius, Celsius, it stays under 40, usually 35. So that worked very well. And um, now I can put the DRAM expansion cards that we restored in the previous episode. I can put uh, them back in, in the proper slots now. I, I lubricated the slots I want to use and I'm putting the two cards um, back in there where they can be used um, at the same time. There we go. It's all looking good. Now, if you notice uh, on the top left of the first expansion card that is on the top of the board, there are some chips there that have a sort of a pinky um, ceramic package. Those are Tesla chips from Eastern Europe. They are 4116s. I don't have a data sheet for them, but the computer didn't like them. Uh, the pages that had those pinky chips that you can see there, uh, they were not working reliably uh, at speed. Uh, only if I was doing single reads and writes, it was working, but at speed, they didn't work reliably. I don't know whether it's because of those tel Tesla chips having too long propagation delay. I don't have the data sheet. Uh, uh, or because I'm putting different chips in the same page. But either way, I removed them all and now all the chips in every single page are identical. But before I did that, I still uh, uh, used the expansion cards. I just reset the addresses so I could use for the lower addresses uh, um, pages that didn't have the pinky uh, chips. So I loaded the most famous game for the Sol 20 called Target. Uh, it takes a couple of minutes uh, to load. I would speed it up now. And the reason for that AM radio is that this game produces sound effects through an interference signal. It interferes with uh, um, uh, AM radio stations. So you can hear uh, sound effects, <laughs> the desirable interference, amplitude modulated interference. Um, so I turn the radio on so we can hear the sound effects of Target. <laughs> Enjoy! This game is fun to play even today. To this day, it is fun to play. <laughs> Those are the dip switches that allow you to select the address of each page. Each card has four pages. And as I mentioned, I swapped out all of those pinky chips from Eastern Europe because I don't know their propagation delay. They were being troublesome. And I replaced them with proper uh, TMS 4116s. So now I have two pages with the original chips in white and the rest with four, proper 4116s. So this is it on the inside of the machine. I don't resist the temptation of giving you a minute and a half of uh, electronics porn. Now, <laughs> enjoy.
and it is now time to close the machine, hopefully for the last time in many years, except for museum demonstrations. So I start by uh, taking out uh, the dust with my ESD safe uh, duster and putting the case uh, back in place. The case has already been cleaned um, with a uh, um, glass cleaner, uh, but I'll have to do some more cleaning you're about to see. I'm also using some, some um, lubricant on the thumb screws uh, because they're very scratchy and I want it to be easier to put them in and out. So I lubricate them a little bit, put back the PL259 to female RCA uh, adapter that we need for the composite signal. Then I clean the fuse holder and uh, put it back in. Now there are still some scuff marks despite my soft cleaning so I'm going to do something a little more abrasive now I'm using a magic eraser with WD-40 this is dangerous it removes paint and I don't plan to respray this so I've been very careful um, um, it, it worked very well but if you do this keep in mind it removes paint so you have to you have to keep monitoring what you're doing once that is done, I remove the excess WD-40 with a, a, a dry fiber cloth because I still want to apply one more surface treatment so I don't want there to be too much oil uh, in there. I'm going to use this museum wax as a final protective layer. And this is a Renaissance uh, wax. Um, it's a microcrystalline wax polish. I, I will read uh, the label for you. Uh, refined waxes blended to a formula used by the British Museum and Restoration Specialists internationally to revive and protect valuable furniture, leather, paintings, metals, marble, ivory, and many other surfaces both housed and exposed to weather. Freshens colors, imparts soft sheen. This is very good and will help um, protect uh, the case. I also use this on the wooden side panels. I didn't show it to you, but I used it there as well. So that's me polishing uh, the metal part with uh, Renaissance um, wax. And of course, I would do a final buffing um, with a flannel to give it a very soft uh, shine. But before that, a little bit more uh, Renaissance uh, wax. This is already the second layer I'm applying. I had already applied uh, wax before. There we go. Does it, it becomes shiny, but not glossy. It's a very specific sheen, very pleasant, very soft. And now it's the final buffing with a, a flannel. I will buff the wax on the wooden panel as well. As I mentioned, I applied the wax there as well for full protection. So, this is uh, the final result now. I hope you've enjoyed this series. There may be one more episode shot at the museum, perhaps. But for now, this is it. I hope you've had fun. Uh, thanks for joining me uh, in this journey. And I will leave you, suitably enough, with what else? Target. <laughs> Enjoy, I will see you uh, next time.